Welcome, Ed. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a unique intro that you have here today, Ash. This is the informal holiday shortened version of the Real Vision Daily Briefing. Yeah, a, a good thing because my mind is totally not on the markets, even though uh, it was a full day in the markets today. Was this the tryptophan from the turkey? Uh, no, no turkey steak, actually, Ash. Nice. I, you know, I've heard that from a number of people. Is that like the thing for 2020? It's like we had enough of like this virus, like we're just going to do steak because that's what we like. Yeah. And, you know, actually, I heard that the tryptophan doesn't uh, it do it doesn't make people sleepy, this, the stuff in the turkey. I don't know if that's true or not, if it's just urban myth. Um, what is not an urban myth is that we had uh, a short day today uh, in U.S. equity markets closing at 1 p.m. We're recording here at about 4.20 uh, uh, p.m. Eastern time, uh, three hours uh, after market close and change. Uh, you know, interesting day, new all-time closing highs on S&P 500 and NASDAQ, S&P 500 closing at 3638 uh, and NASDAQ settling at 12205 It's been a long, slow roll up. Here, uh, I think all three major uh, equity indices in the U.S. are up two percent on the week or more. Yeah, actually, I think I saw that uh, November was shaping up to be the best month since January 1987. So that's 33 years. So it's a, it's been a blockbuster month, the the yeah. month of November. Uh, I don't actually attribute it to anything in the sense of you know some people might say it's a Biden win. Uh, and therefore markets are up, or it's a vaccine, and therefore markets are up. I don't know if you can make that attribution, but um, pe there is a lot of uh, of euphoria. There's a lot of positives, and we have a lot of stimulus we, in, in the turn in uh, monetary policy that's in the works. So there's a yeah. lot of liquidity uh, sloshing out there, and th and that's positive for for the markets. Yeah, and that's exactly right. You know, it's always uh, difficult to peg the news flow uh, to particular moves in the market, but it has been uh, overwhelmingly a positive uh, uh, 10 days or so for, um, for markets. We have now three COVID vaccines. Uh, this is a, a good thing for, uh, for the economy, a good thing for the country, and, and obviously a good thing uh, for the world. Um, we've got the, what appears to be the removal of a lot of political risk uh, in the form of uh, a, a GSA uh, chair, uh, the General Services Administration coming forward and effectively saying uh, in a letter uh, to Vice President, to President elect Joseph Biden, I think it's fair to say at this point uh, that the transition will continue. Um, so political risk coming off the table. And finally, um, one more major headline event of the week that I'm really curious to get your opinion on, Ed, because we haven't had a chance to talk since this story broke. Uh, Fed chair, former Fed chair Janet Yellen, uh, apparently tapped to run uh, the Treasury Department. Yeah, so all of the, the different uh, negatives are mostly off the table. I think that the one thing that's overhanging the markets uh, or actually, let me just say that there are two things overhanging the markets. But from a non-economic perspective, the only thing that's overhanging the markets is a potential strike against Iran. People have been talking about that. There might be some military action. Uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a market driver, but it's the economics over the short to medium term. That's the, the real question. How much of an impact is that going to have on markets? M most people seem to be looking through that. But Yellen, yeah, people are looking at that as a very as a positive thing in terms of you have someone in there who knows all the people, knows where the bodies are buried, has all the relationships, can work well with Powell. So everything's setting up to be as good as it possibly can be. Uh, yeah. The the caveats that I would say to that are on the economic front, we have the COVID-19 crisis, we have shutdowns. A lot of the data have been underwhelming in the last week, two weeks. Uh, we also have three deadlines in terms of the fiscal cliff uh, coming forward. And we're on our Thanksgiving holiday that's really gonna cut it tight in terms of getting that sorted out. And that could potentially be a headwind for the economy over the short term. And then of course, we have the potential that there could be gridlock uh, post January 20th, 2021. So those are negatives. I think overall the market is saying that they're not negative enough uh, for us to continue moving higher. Yeah. 
Yeah, well said. And and of course, uh, the uh, the other important point about uh, about Chair Yellen, soon to be Secretary Yellen, it would seem, uh, is that uh, she's obviously been very vocal about her support uh, for additional spending, particularly for unemployment and small businesses, which are particularly stimulative for the reasons that we've talked about, the marginal propensity to consume versus marginal propensity to save reasons. And she also favors credit support, which is now set to expire at the end of the year against uh, Fed recommendations, that decision uh, being med- made by the current Secretary of Treasury, uh, uh, Mr. Mnuchin. You, you know, not to put a wrench in all of this, uh, one thought that I've had uh, in terms of the eventual stimulus package, if there is one, let's just say that there is uh, a stimulus package that actually is on the table, uh, or there are two or three variations that are on the table. You have the one, which is the Democrat led one. And then you have the, the other, which is the Republican led one. The, the Republican uh, led one is very small. Uh, it's t- more targeted. The Democrats are looking for a much bigger plan. Nancy Pelosi up until now, she said, we're not going to accept the, the smaller package. Uh, but that was before the election. Uh, and now we, the election's in the rearview mirror. Are they going to accept a smaller package now or in the future with a potential uh, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen in office who's aligned with Nancy Pelosi. And and obviously Joe Biden would be aligned as well. So it's something to think about in terms of if she's talking about doing something for the working and middle classes, uh, higher marginal propensity to spend, and we really want to do a large package to the degree that the Senate is Republican, uh, can they get that by? And if they can't get it by, would they therefore default back to the Republicans' uh, bogey, which is in the order of 500 million, 500 billion? Sorry, I, I honestly think that there is the possibility uh, that it's neither the Republican package or the Democrats' package. It could be no package, no compromise between the between the two sides. So the dispersion of potential outcomes just from a stimul- stimulative perspective is not between 500 billion and 2 trillion or 500 billion and 3 trillion it's 0 and 3 trillion so uh, we we still have to see on the political front if there really is a meeting of the minds uh, now in this lame duck session and also in 2021 yeah, an absolutely crucial distinction there, Ed. Uh, and talking about dispersion of outcomes, we have to say, Georgia, 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 still unclear about what the result of that Senate runoff is going to be. I think it's on January 5th. I'm not following it closely, but the polling data that I've seen is incredibly close. Two Senate seats up for grabs. Uh, either one of them could be the swing. Uh, Democrats need to flip both of them. Uh, into the blue column if Republicans uh, pick up one, uh, obviously, or both, uh, Senate stays in Republican hands. Obviously, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell remains holding the gavel in that case. Yeah, so uh, interestingly, I think uh, Donald Trump is a big part in this because uh, on the one hand, he's been talking about fraud in the election, and in particular, he's been talking about fraud in Georgia. And there are many Trump supporters who are upset about that. And potentially those people may boycott or not vote. I've I've seen uh, talk of we're not going to engage. Now, obviously, Donald Trump, he may be thinking to himself, I'm going to disengage myself. Or he might be thinking this is my last hurrah to really submit my legacy and I'm going to go down there and uh, and make sure that the people who voted for me in November also vote for these senators or these potential senators in uh, in in January. And he said as much for the first time in a press conference yesterday. He said, yes, I'm going to go and campaign in Georgia because many of the Republicans in the Senate have not heard a whole lot from President Trump in terms of what his plan was, whether he's going to do something there. So we'll we'll just have to wait and see. So irrespective of where the polls are, I think the answer is it all depends on the turnout, uh, both uh, on the Democrat side and on the Republican side. Yeah, that is the much more sophisticated inside the Beltway analysis. I think of it as, hey, it's a coin toss. I just can't tell. Yeah. And I think that that's probably the right thing, Ash, is that 
we really don't know what's going to happen, especially because of turnout. It's it's not like there's a, a presidential election at the exact same time. And a lot of people are going to uh, have mail-in ballots. They've already, I think, said that it's something in the order of 700,000 mail-in ballots. Uh, so yeah. the whole thing could be, uh, it could be messy, honestly. Yeah. And that number, I, I hadn't heard that 700,000 uh, mail-in ballot number before. That's an interesting number because that's that's like several orders of magnitude higher uh, than the delta between the uh, between the two candidates in the last uh, in the last election. Yeah. So I, I think it could be quite uh, quite an interesting road uh, between January the 5th and January the 20th. Uh, Trump has said that he would, if they certify and the electors actually uh, uh, go with Biden in the same press conference when he talked about going down to Georgia and trying to help them out, he said that he would leave the White House. What does that actually mean? I don't know. It might mean that he leaves the White House immediately, uh, you know, and he goes down to Florida. And then from there, he actually uh, does what he needs to do to try to drum up support for the Republican side. Jeez, that's a that's a really interesting uh, thought that I, I hadn't had. You know, Ed, to pick up on something that you mentioned earlier, uh, the risk of potential conflict with Iran. There's been some news flow on this front here, and you know, I have, haven't gone much deeper into this than the headline, but uh, it appears as though uh, the chief uh, of the Iranian nuclear program uh, was assassinated uh, in a city in in Iran today. Uh, and this word coming from the uh, from the Iranian. Defense Department. I'm not a policy wonk, Middle Eastern uh, policy, not my specialty, but it seems as though this is uh, what I believe Mr. Bezos called a complexifier. Yeah, I, w the the biggest news to, to think about Iran that came out was that the Israeli defense, uh, they were actually getting themselves ready because they had heard rumblings that uh, there might be a strike and they needed to be prepared if there was a strike from the United States against Iranian nuclear facilities before uh, uh, President Trump left office, that, you know, there would be, they, they need to be ready as well, because this is in their backyard. They're very much involved in this. And it's not that they would actually do the strike, but rather that they needed to be ready for the strike. And so the incident that you're talking about is on the back of that. So clearly something is going on. Uh, with regard to Iran, uh, you can speculate whether or not Mark Esper was uh, was down with that. And maybe that's one of the reasons that he was fired. But again, there is some political turmoil, uh, some political risk at the margins. I don't necessarily think that that has a huge uh, impact on the economy uh, or on markets uh, now, uh, nor do I think that it necessarily will, if anything, comes to fruition. Yeah, I mean, I think right now the most definitive thing that we can say uh, is it's something to keep an eye on, especially yeah. ahead of the transition. And, and, you know, what I'm keeping an eye on the most uh, is the coronavirus. Uh, I think that it's it's really, if you want to talk about coronavirus, it's not whether or not, uh, you know, measures are good or whether they're bad. It's not whether or not uh, you need to wear a mask or not. In the United States, uh, as opposed to many other countries, that's a very political decision, i.e., if you are pro-mask, if you're pro-measures, uh, then you're on one side, and if you're not, you're on the other side. And people are taking uh, some sort of political outcome as a result of what side you're on. I'm not on either side. I'm actually on the side of what does that mean for the economy, i.e., when we know what's happening now, and what we think will happen in the near future, what does it mean in terms of what the economic impact is? I believe we've already seen the economic impact, particularly in uh, the hospitality industry. And I believe that the numbers in the United States are high enough that we're going to see more of that. And so we're, the economy is definitely already rolling over right now in the United States. The question is how much it's going to roll over and it, will markets take a breath, a, a breath as a result of that? I think the answer is uh, yes, uh, it does have potential negative implications for the market, if not on a broader scale, certainly on a specific sector and company specific scale. Yeah, that's a really crisp strategic overview of the intersection between coronavirus uh, and, uh, and economics and markets. 
you know, to take it to a slightly more tactical level, uh, to look at the data here a bit, if, you know, the, the big question, I suppose, uh, on, on scientists' mind right now is what is going to be the impact of this holiday travel season? Uh, obviously, people uh, have been flying and driving, uh, going to visit relatives, uh, you know, sometimes uh, spending Thanksgivings uh, indoors, uh, especially here in the Northeast where the weather is, uh, is rather brisk. Um, looking at the daily trends right now, there's been a pretty steep rollover, actually, uh, fortunately to the downside, a decreasing number uh, of cases, new cases being reported. It's a sharp decrease, but it's a very short line. In other words, uh, it's a trend that's only been in place uh, for a couple of days now, the last uh, couple of days of data, perhaps suggesting some of the enhanced measures uh, have been working. On the flip side of the coin- well, uh, you know, Let me inter but, interrupt you there. Yeah. You know, I've been looking at the data pretty assiduously, and there are three 2,000 death uh, days in the last three days, uh, followed by uh, uh, just 1,000 deaths in the in the last day's report, if you look at the New York Times figures that they report on a daily basis. And yeah. the reason for that is think of uh, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday as one long weekend. And we know that in terms of the weekends, uh, in the past, what's happened is is that you know there are fewer tests and also there are fewer reports. So the numbers yeah. that we're seeing now, uh, both for Wednesday and then Thursday, are are similar to what you might expect for a Saturday and Sunday. So then, what what I anticipate to happen, and and I've I've seen reports about this, uh, so that everyone can be prepared, is that starting on say Tuesday because Monday will be uh, data from over the weekend. Starting on Tuesday, we're gonna see a massive uptick in uh, the number of deaths and probably also the number of reported cases, irrespective of what the, the trend is. The pre-Thanksgiving right. uh, trend was actually higher. Uh, we, uh, the only places where it was going down were the places that it was the highest, North Dakota, South Dakota. So we have a trend in place in terms of the infection rates and in terms of the deaths, that is definitely going to take us to new levels. And temporarily, it might take us to ridiculously high levels. We could get a 3,000 number, death number in there next week. I just think people should be prepared for that just because we're not re recording certain things right now just because it's a long weekend in the United States. Well, you know, that's exactly where I was going. I was about to point out the, the death count, which has been steadily rising. And obviously, that is a lagging indicator. Um, you know, there's a significant period of time between when people are diagnosed uh, and when they uh, and when they unfortunately die from this disease. And precisely to your point, I don't know if we can show the chart here today, uh, but what you're talking about is this stair-stepping pattern that we see in the case count data, uh, which is to say the weekend effect. So what you see is you see a kind of one, two, three, four, five drop. And then irrespective of where the trend is going to go, if it's going to be up for the next week, it's the same effect, one, two, three, four, five stair step drop. And that's really an important point to point out. And if you don't actually look uh, at the charts, it's very difficult to see. The moving averages, uh, which is uh, precisely what you were alluding to, uh, once again, absolutely rising dramatically in terms of case count. There are three peaks in the data when you look at the uh, when you look at the chart. Uh, the third peak is far and away the highest. Now, once again, there are going to be those who say that's unmasking effect. We're actually doing a better job of testing. Testing is more widely available, and therefore people are testing positive at higher rates. That's certainly true. Uh, also, the idea. Uh, that some younger people are getting the disease who are less severely affected, also true. But precisely to your point, Ed, when you look at the big picture, when you look at that seven-day moving average of the death counts, it is something to be very concerned about. Yeah, so I mean, I would say that we're testing more people. Uh, uh, we also are having fewer people that are hospitalized of those who are tested because we're testing more. When you are hospitalized, the outcomes are better. Uh, because we know how to deal with the virus as a result. And therefore, overall, the numbers uh, in terms of the death rates are much lower. I believe yeah. the last number I saw was 1.9%. So one, and, and, and you know, I've been looking at some epidemiologists and what they say, 1.5% is the number that they're using uh, to predict going forward. So if you think that there's a three week, uh, sometimes Trevor Bedford, he was saying 22 day a lag between uh, when someone gets the, the virus and then the 1.5% on average that die, 
uh, then what we know is, is all of the stuff that happened before Thanksgiving, supplant that, multiply that times 1.5%, that, that will give you the numbers for post Thanksgiving. And so then the question becomes purely from, and not from a partisan perspective, purely from, is that enough of an overload to create a situation where uh, local municipalities and states will make some sort of curbs on activity? Right. Will people independently uh, do any sort of curbs? And therefore, what impact does that have on the economy as a result? I yes. believe the numbers that you were quoting, they're going up so much that we are going to see more curbs and then add in the potential that Thanksgiving will be even worse because it's a, a potentially massive super spreader event. And then you have not just a rolling over, but a massive rollover of the economy. Just as, by the way, we, we get into this December period where we have these three fiscal cliffs. So to me, all of that points to downside risk, not necessarily writ large in, in the markets, but for individual segments of the markets, individual companies in the market. Yeah, and you've been ahead of the curve on this point, and you mentioned this uh, a bit in, in what you just said, uh, which was this idea of, I guess you could call it almost a self-lockdown effect. When the, uh, when the case count starts rising, when people start being hospitalized, irrespective of whether or not governments at the federal or state level or even local level impose increased restrictions and curbs, people automatically themselves withdraw uh, from effectively from the economy, which has the impact. And, you know, I'm, as you know, because of uh, my prior uh, case of extolling Sweden to a certain degree, I'm anti-lockdown. I'm anti-shutdown. I think shutdowns are negative for the economy. The shutdowns that we had in March, they were negative. If you can avoid shutdowns, that's, that's the greatest thing. Uh, however, I understand that, you know, when you get to a certain point, you have to take a response. And, the, yeah. you know, there's an incremental step up from the response that people are taking to when the government shuts down. The question is, is what should the government do and at what point should they do it? Rather than get into that um, debate, let's remember that Sweden itself had a massive hemorrhaging of GDP, not just because they're an export-oriented economy, but because exactly what you said, uh, Ash. That is that people, they automatically themselves um, decided to pull back. I think the pullback that we'll see in this particular juncture is probably less than we saw initially because people have a better grip on you know, what to do, how to act. We've dealt with the virus for a longer period of time, so there's not going to be as much of a, a hit to the economy based on individual uh, consumer behavior. But once you get into the shutdowns and the lockdowns, that's going to add an incremental uh, negative to what happens in the economy. Yeah. You know, I'm also curious, uh, the Swedish model has begun to uh, show some of uh, the strains. Obviously, they've had uh, some very negative data uh, over the last, uh, say, two weeks or so. And what's interesting to me is Sweden may be the only place uh, in the industrialized, uh, the industrialized nations uh, where people are just not wearing masks. Right. Yeah, I think that, uh, one, Sweden has moved much more towards the rest of the Nordics in terms of their overall protocols. Uh, yeah. But also the numbers, just like they were in March and in April and May, in Sweden are much worse than they are in Finland, Denmark yeah. and Norway, which would suggest that their policy response has come at the detriment of uh, public health outcomes. The question is, is whether or not the trade off or the, the supposed trade off to the economy helps them. I think that the, the Nordic countries uh, looking at what happens there in terms of their economies uh, would be interesting. Uh, I, I think Norway thus far is the most interesting just from a, a public policy and economic perspective because they've really managed it relatively well, um, you know, both during the first initial period and then now as, as well. Yeah. And while we're speaking here, I'm curious, since we haven't talked in a few days, uh, what are your thoughts about what's been happening in Europe? You follow that much more closely than I do as an economic story and also from the COVID data perspective. Yeah, I think that uh, two or three things. The first thing is that we saw negative PMI data uh, uh, three months on the trot, which would suggest that people were pulling back as the numbers got higher before you actually had the lockdowns, which were very recent. 
uh, the countries that locked down the most uh, were the countries that were behind the curve the most, i.e. France was behind the curve. The numbers were, were much more dramatic in France than they were in Germany, and therefore the lockdown was greater. And, th and so they locked down at, even though in time, it was at a, the exact same time or relatively close in time, it was a much more severe lockdown, and it was later in terms of the, the spread of the virus relative to Germany. And so the outcomes from a PMI perspective are worse in France than they are in Germany. So France is a, an example of uh, why you want to take potential measures earlier. Germany is an example of if you take measures earlier, you might actually escape with a better economic outcome. So those are the those are the things that I'm looking at in terms of Europe right now. Overall, uh, they're in recession. So there's a double dip in Europe, and uh, hopefully they'll be able to come out of this by the Christmas uh, time frame and 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 start to uh, to grow again. But that might not be the case. Maybe uh, you know we'll, we'll see another wave. Uh, once uh, once they release in, um, in 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 December, yeah, you know, and since we're doing this uncharacteristically on a Friday, I get to ask you a question I've often wanted to ask, which is, what are you looking for in the week ahead? So yeah, uh, I'm looking for in the week ahead is is a uh, from the market's perspective is a consolidation of some of the trends that we've seen. So not only in terms of the S and P, the Nasdaq rotation, et cetera. But I think it's interesting if you look at WTI, if you look at Brent, the numbers are really high. Uh, I think we're looking at 45, 48 copper. Uh, the numbers are high. They're going up. Uh, so across the board, all of the all of the markets are showing that sort of we're ready to move off to the races type of, of, of euphoria. We're looking through any of these negative trends that we're seeing over the short term. And, and looking forward to the vaccine period. And, uh, and that's everything except the, uh, the Treasury market, which has somewhat started to, uh, to, to uh, have the yields roll over. So yeah. I think that's an interesting uh, dichotomy there. So I'm looking at that dichotomy to see if that plays out in any discernible way. Yeah, very well summed up. Ed, any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm very amped about the whole uh, political discussion in the United States, the polarization on uh, a lot of issues. That you know, it, to me, people are always looking: Are you uh, with with us, or are you against us? In terms of you know w what people are saying, and I think that it's a it's very indicative of where we are, uh, the United States in particular. Um, and I think that it's very difficult to talk about markets, to talk about the economy without people second guessing everything that you're saying, if you're saying it from a Democrat perspective or a Republican perspective. My personal view, I don't like either party, to be honest with you. I've been a lifelong independent, and I take a look at the data based upon uh, what I think are likely outcomes, not based upon any political preference. And I, th I hope that other people, uh, do the same. Well summarized. You know, one thing that we haven't touched on yet is the crypto markets, which have obviously been red hot for the last several weeks. Bitcoin rolling over a bit the last few days, trading now uh, at around 450 uh, here on Friday afternoon at about 17,000, off a little bit uh, from its highs in the 19,000 level, uh, but up considerably from 10,000 uh, for the last uh, three months, which is where it's hovered. Interesting time for those markets. Um, are you following those markets at all? I am, yeah. And uh, what I was going to tell you is, is I looked at the uh, price action in particular in gold and silver as well. Yeah. Uh, silver was down three uh, percent. Gold was down one and a quarter percent today. Gold uh, trading at uh, below eighteen hundred. Silver, you know, twenty two sixty eight. The last quote that I saw. So that's in line with what you're talking about, except there's more volatility, obviously, in uh, cryptocurrencies. If, for me, if I had a secondary uh, thing to watch over the next week, it would be that. It's uh, you know I talked about the bond market versus uh, the the stimulus trade, the uh, power forward trade. When you look at Brent, when you look at copper, when you look at the S and P, when you look at the Nasdaq. But I would like to look at where yields are on the ten year. What what's happening there 
versus what's happening in precious metals and, and cryptocurrencies, because that is yeah. telling you something both in terms of liquidity and also in terms of you know potential uh, canaries in the coal mine about uh, economic risk. You know, it's interesting. Um, you're mentioning the uh, U.S. Treasury market, uh, precious metals, especially gold. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is uh, as uh, as Bitcoin starts to roll up toward that twenty thousand mark, there's always more discussion. And over the last two weeks, there's been a lot of it uh, about uh, the potential for Bitcoin at some date in the future, obviously, to uh, have a significant role as a store of value play, potentially uh, displacing some of the ownership of gold. At least that's what's being said in the community. Obviously, uh, people who are passionate about gold, uh, many of them uh, feel very differently. But it is interesting. Another cryptocurrency that has seen a lot of, uh, of momentum over the last few days uh, is Ethereum. Uh, and this is of particular interest uh, to us at Real Vision because we are scheduled on Monday to release an Ethereum documentary, which is an investigation uh, into Ethereum. What is it? What functions does it perform? And why is it something uh, that seems to be a, such a significant player in crypto markets? If you look at the uh, aggregate market capitalizations of these current coins, uh, you know some call it uh, total network value. Um, number two uh, behind Bitcoin is always Ethereum. And we're going to talk about that in a documentary. Um, it's Raul uh, and myself and Alex Saunders uh, from Nuggets News, who actually interviewed uh, Vitalik Buterin, who's the co-founder and really uh, the luminary mostly driving uh, the Ethereum uh, the Ethereum adoption. Uh, I also spoke to uh, Joe Lubin, who is the founder um, and, uh, and CEO um, at uh, Consensus, which is perhaps uh, the best known company who's operating in the Bitcoin, uh, excuse me, in the Ethereum space uh, right now, talking about a whole series of different applications. And additionally, Alex interviewed five or six other people uh, who are significant players in the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, people who are developing uh, Ethereum core, people who are members of the community, people who are involved with the Ethereum foundation. It's something that if you're at all interested uh, in the cryptocurrency space, if you've heard about Ethereum but don't quite know what it is, this is the place to start. Yeah, and uh, Ash, uh, let me just say that you're 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 playing a de deadpan, but you know this is a hyped up you know, sort of thing. I'm pretty excited as someone who's not in this space. You know, you have to get really amped up. I mean, I think it's it's a great thing. Uh, I'm I'm going to play the hype man today. People should definitely uh, check it out. Watch this documentary. So thanks for adding that little piece at the end, and uh, you know, have a great weekend. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Ed, I'm always deadpan. This is me unbelievably jacked up excited. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Enjoy the holiday weekend.